student day. And in honor of that, this class will not meet on October 6th. So, to celebrate this. <laughs> Pardon me? That's strange to have a day off for a student day. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll, give you, we'll give you the day off in this class, just this class. Okay. <laughs> All right. If you're paying attention, you'll notice that that's a Thursday and we don't have class anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm feeling, I'm feeling, uh, I'm, I'm feeling ordery today, I guess. Uh, I, I have a feeling this is just some like one of them college bookstore holidays, you know, <laughs> that they declared. So I have no idea. I shouldn't make fun of it until I know what it is. But this class will not meet on National Students Day. If anyone from my other classes are watching, that doesn't apply to you. We're going to honor you by giving an especially better lecture on that day. We'll, we'll amp it up a little bit. All right? Okay. There has been serious schedule changes. Now everyone's not going to believe anything I say as far as the schedule. They're just going to like, you know, oh, what, is that Thanksgiving or something? No, these are serious changes. The due date for Lab 4 has been changed to 926th. I, I must have blew that one when I originally scheduled it because I was pretty, uh, I think I had to do today. And that was... Uh, or maybe Wednesday, I don't know. It was a, it was a pretty aggressive uh, schedule, and especially with, uh, with the midterm coming up, you know, we might as well let it go until, uh, make the due date a week from today. 919, which is today, and 921, we'll be covering validation and maybe some loose ends. Um, probably spend a lot of the time on validation. Uh, 926 will re be review, and 928 will be the JavaScript quiz. And I should, by the end of this week, or, yeah, by the end of this week, let's say, um, have some uh, notes, study guides, notes on the quiz and all that uh, about the exact format of the quiz. So um, be looking out for that. One thing to keep in mind, again, you know, don't think that this, this is like the end of JavaScript, all right? You're not done with it that quick, all right? You're not, you, you know, you can't uh, forget about it that quickly. Um, we will continue to do more and more JavaScript. For example, this validation that we're going to talk about now um, is likely that in your first PHP lab, you'll need to also include some JavaScript validation. Or if not your first, then maybe your second. All right. So we are, even though, even though the formal coverage of it as a topic is going to end, we're going to continue this throughout the whole semester. All right. So um, just be aware uh, of that. All right, here's a good potential quiz question. Of course, by saying it's a potential quiz question, that means I'm probably not going to ask it now. But this would be a fair quiz question. Client-side serving. Client, ah, take two. Validation of form entry should be done, and this is not a true or false question, A, on the client side, B, on the server side, C, all of the above, or D, none of the above. What would you say the answer to that is? Okay, we have a vote for, for A and for C, some of them. This actually is one that should be done on both. And let me explain to you why it should be done on both. All right? Um, let's draw our, our favorite, famous diagram here where we have the client, the internet, and our web server that's running a server-side script. Now most of the time, the client is displaying a blank form and allowing the user to enter data that gets sent to the server. That's the typical uh, scenario here. All right. Now as far as validating that data, 
the statement was made that it should be done both client and server side. Let's make sure we understand why I say that. First of all, why would we do it on the client side? Uh, yes. Um, the reason that we would do it on the client side is that it will give it's a win-win situation. It will give a quicker response to the client. All right. If they type in something and there's an error, and that client side script gets it, it doesn't have to be sent to the server and make a round trip back for the client to get their error message. The error message can be delivered uh, instantaneously. Um, it's also good for the server, right? Because why should the server try to process something that clearly isn't complete? For example, if you went to Amazon and tried to place an order without uh, entering in a credit card number, all right? There's no way that the Amazon server can process that order if there's no credit card number. It just isn't going to work. So therefore, why even send that to the server if it's doomed? If there's an obvious mistake that you know is not going to work. So it's a win-win situation. The client will get an immediate result because if the validation is done on this form before it's submitted, that happens instantaneously. The JavaScript code has been downloaded with the web page and the client can get the feedback instantly that it is an invalid form. And the server benefits from not having to uh, make a trip back and forth, uh, not, not having to deal with bad data. Okay? Thank you. And the server um, um, doesn't have to worry about dealing with data that, that you know is doomed that you know is bad. I'm not sure the sentence I, I just said prior to there, I got distracted and, and who knows what I said. But the bottom line is the server doesn't need to worry about uh, data that, that is doomed, that you know it's not going to be good. It's like if you submitted a job application, right? And maybe you gave the job, at, you know, you, you went into a place and the receptionist gives you a job application and you fill it out. The receptionist might glance at it and if they find that you forgot to fill on the section or that you forgot to sign it or date it or whatever, it's better if they can like find it and give it to you right away as opposed to let you get all the way home, have someone review it, and then tell you, oh, wait a minute, there's a problem with your, with your, um, with your application. Okay, well, if client-side validation is so good and it gives a quick response and it's a win-win for everyone, why would we ever do server-side validation then? Why is the answer all of the above, client and server side? In case JavaScript's turned off. One big reason is in case JavaScript's turned off. People could either intentionally or unintentionally try to, you know, get past, circumvent the um, client side validation by turning their JavaScript off or even accidentally doing it and give the server bad data. And if the server isn't looking for that, it could cause problems. Yeah, uh, exactly, because again, it may be that client-side uh, uh, validation isn't running on that particular client because they've disabled it. What's another reason that you would want to do server-side validation? Security. Security? How so? Okay. Uh, there are all sorts of security issues, including what you said of, of the possibility of giving input for a SQL injection attack or whatever. I guess the question is, is why would you validate that on the server as opposed to on the client? Pardon me? Yeah, people could, could try to subvert again your client-side scripting and, and, and put in data sort of through a backdoor method. Um, other thoughts? Of, of things that you would want to do on a server versus client. Yes? Well, the data that you enter as a client needs to be compared to some database on the server. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like, for example, logging on. All right? You could, through client-side scripting, make sure that someone enters in a username and password. Right? You can't. It would be impractical and unwise and insecure and so on to validate that to make sure that it was a legal user ID and password, right? So I could have validation to make sure that someone enters something in, right? And if they didn't enter anything in, they're clearly wrong, 
display an error message and make them enter it again on the client side. But if they enter the user ID and password, we have to go and look that up in the database and say, yes, that's a valid password. No, that's not a valid password. So there's certain operations for whatever reason. Security uh, is typically the case. Um, the um, client may either lack the resources or the ability or it's undesirable to validate on, on, on the client side. Another example would be validating a credit card. We could validate a credit card, you know, on going back to the Amazon example, to make sure that a credit card was entered. We could even validate to make sure that the credit card looked like a valid credit card number, right? That it was the, the proper number of digits. I forget, they're 15 or 16 digits long, I think, depending, American Express or not American Express. Right. But there's a certain size for them. You know, five isn't someone's credit card number, right? So we could validate that on the client side, sort of a, a, uh, a very straightforward rule. But to validate that is a valid credit card number. The name matches the name. The name that was entered matches the name on the credit card number. The credit card isn't, hasn't been reported lost or stolen. The credit card uh, isn't uh, exceeding its limit. The credit card hasn't expired. All those sorts of things we have to do on the client. So the bottom line is, is we're going to do validation both on the client and the server side. The validation that we can do in the client side is great because we can give a quick response and, and make it more interactive. Despite that, we're going to repeat that validation on the server side and in many cases even add some additional validation um, for things that can't or are impractical, impossible, undesirable to validate on the client side. Okay. Let's take a look at our um, Fahrenheit to centigrade conversion and let's, let's start playing around with the validation. All right. Um, and we'll add some validation to it and then maybe we'll extend it to do um, other sorts of, uh, of examples. But we'll use this one as our starting off point. Now, remember the, the basis of um, all our client-side scripting is that there's some sort of action that the user takes that invokes some JavaScript. The JavaScript can access and manipulate the stuff that's on the page and it can then change the page to reflect the results. So, in our conversion example, right now, I think the limit is that the, that the uh, temperature has to be uh, between 0 and 100. I think other than that, problems start. All right? So, or 0 and 212 rather. No, 32 and 212. All right? So, if we type some garbage in here, we're going to get some garbage out. N-A-N. N-A-N means what? <laughs> I was going to say, it's one of those so obvious you probably would think, no, it can't be that. Not a number. You know, you can't convert GGDG, <laughs> you know, to Fahrenheit or to centigrade. So it's just not a number. All right. Obviously, we don't want to have that happen. That, um, you know, consider this operation, you know, if a user were to see that, they'll have no idea really what that means. All right. We want to give a nice error message instead that says, please enter that in. Likewise, if we don't enter anything in, it actually doesn't give us an error, but it acts as though we entered in zero, all right, which isn't good. Um, and likewise, if we enter in too high of a, a number, um, we have potential problems as well. Not so much with the numerical uh, comparison, but with our little thermometer graph that we drew over here. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to validate, and we're going to validate in a couple steps. All right. Um, I've identified three or four, I guess it depends how you count them, problem areas. I identified it as a problem if nothing is entered. I've identified it as a problem if something is entered and it's not a number. And I've identified if something is entered and it's uh, outside of the valid range that it's a problem. So what we're going to do is we're going to validate this. All right. We are not going to use alert boxes to display our validation method, uh, our validation results. That's like really old school. 
That's how they did it back in the bad old days, and we're not going to do that. All right. We're also going to validate the entire form as opposed to validating a field. If you find a problem, then stop. All right. That's also sort of old school, and it's very frustrating to find out that you forgot to put your phone number in, so you put that in, then a second later you get an error message saying you forgot your email address, then you forgot your birth date, and so on. We're going to display all the errors at once. Now in this case there's only one field, so that's kind of easy, but in, in subsequent examples we're going to go and we're going to validate the whole form, as much of it as we can, all right? and we're going to display all the error messages that we can. All right, so how to do this validation? What I'm going to do first of all is, I'm going to look at this code. I have a calculate function. And that's what gets called if the button is clicked. All right. This one's a little different than the example that I showed up on uh, the handwritten diagram because this never sends the code to the server. So this one will be exclusively all client side. All right. Oftentimes the button that we're dealing with is actually a submit button. And the results, if they're valid, get sent to the server to be processed. In this case, the client is doing all the processing. So this will be a little bit different of an example. At any rate, what I'm going to do here is when the button is clicked, I call the calculate function. I'm going to put, I'm going to make some changes to the validate function. Or I'm sorry, the calculate function to include a validate function. Oops, that's not what I want to do. Validate form. Now, one thing I say over and over again in, in, in my classes is to do a, a, a tiny piece at a time. So we're not going to try to do all the validation all at once. In fact, in my first step, I'm going to actually fake the validation. All right, I'm just going to fake the validation and well, I'm going to make sure I just have the mechanics right of calling the function and getting return value and all that. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm simply going to return true and say, yep, the form validates. Now you might think that that's kind of dumb or kind of useless, uh, but I don't feel it is. In the old days, this was called a stub function. You know, if you're not ready to write the whole function, you write just, you fake the function, in other words. All right you have it return just a hard-coded value or like this validate function I'm saying yep it's true all right and what I'm going to do is I'm doing this just to make sure that I have the communication between the different modules in this code working so we'll hard code it as true in a second we'll hard code it as being false all right and we'll see um, and we'll make sure that um, we're, we're set with this okay I'm going to do this if What is this code doing? The code that says if validate form. Well, I'm calling the function validate form. That's what that means. Anytime you see the parentheses after something, it indicates a function call. And that is true, it runs, runs exactly. This gets evaluated. If this is true, which means that the form is valid, it will go and it will continue and do its validation. If it returns a false, then it will not do this validation. So let's just make sure that we have everything going correctly. Right now, I'm faking the function 
and I'm saying that it's valid. It's th that boolean is true. So if I go and type in, all right, it works. I can also do the reverse of hard coding it as false. And now, whatever I put in, it doesn't continue to do the calculation because I've hard coded it to always uh, say that it didn't validate correctly. Now, that may not seem like a big deal to you, all right? But in my mind, it is because I've linked up. I have my button calling my calculate, my calculate calling the validate, the validate doing its thing, coming up with an answer, and then based on whether that answer is true or false, either the calculation continues or it doesn't. All right. So structurally, this is down. This is going. All I have to do now is fill in the details of that validate function. All right. Which, well, you know, may be easy, may be hard, but I don't have to worry, or I shouldn't have to worry about that mechanism and that flow of how how the program goes. All right. So first thing I'm going to do. When we write the validation, and if you don't believe me, try to write it the other way. All right? But our validation code will go better if we assume the form is valid and look for problems. All right? It's kind of like the old thing in math, you know, to prove that a theory is true, you have to prove every case, but to prove it's false, you only have to find one problem. Well, we're going to try to prove that this is false. So we're going to look for that one problem. So I'm going to assume if I can't find a problem that this form is valid. So I'm going to set a variable called b is valid and initialize it to true. And I'm going to say assume the form is valid unless we find a problem. All right. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to check for an empty text box. All right. Now, we may not know exactly how to do that, but we should know part of it. All right? If equals an empty string, if this condition is true, text box is empty. And therefore, what do we know? We know that it's not valid. So we can say b is valid equals false. When we're all done with our validation, I'm going to return b is valid. Okay, so let's watch what's happening. I have my code up here that calls validate form. I call validate form. I'm going to assume the form is valid until I found out otherwise. I'm going to test the value of that text box and see if it matches an empty string. If it does match the em an, an empty string, then I have a problem. And Therefore, I change the value of b is valid to false. If there's nothing in that text box, then that form is not valid. All right? And then I go and return the value of b is valid. So b is valid. If no problem is detected, it will be returned as true, and the calculation will continue. If a problem is found, that is, there is nothing in the text box, 
then B, uh, B valid will not be true. It will be false and no calculation will happen. So let's go and let's make sure that this works. So, convert to centigrade, nothing happens because the text box is empty. I put something in there, it works. I put nothing in there, it doesn't calculate anymore. So, it sort of looks like it's working, right? Except for what? Well, yeah, we still have that problem. We still have that problem. But what don't we like? Let's just think about this empty validation. What don't we like about this? It doesn't tell anyone what's going on here. All right? So therefore, what we want to do is we want to inform the user. How would you like to inform the user? Well, we could inform the user a lot of different ways, right? What's one way that we could inform the user? Please enter a valid number. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I don't know about that one. We could display a message on the, on the screen. Again, we don't want to display an alert to alert a message. All right, but we could pop up a message on the screen. Do we know how to do that in code? Have we seen examples of that? Yes. We can set the inner HTML of something to say please enter value. Let's do that one to start. Let's go in here. And... Let's put next to the text box a span with an ID of error temp and initially nothing will be in it. We can then say document get element by ID error temp dot inner HTML equals please enter temperature. And we get the error message there. It says, please enter temperature. All right. Now, a couple things with this. First of all, if we now enter a valid temperature, it still says that, right? So we have to go and we have to clear that out every time we do a validation. That shouldn't be a problem. So we can clear that out every time we do a validation. We can clear out our error message so that if we don't enter something in, if we then enter something in, error message disappears. All right. What else could we do to really make those error messages stand out? Pardon me? Yeah, yeah color them, make them red, make it a bigger font, whatever. Uh, another way to put it, another way to put it, is we could change the style of something. All right. What could we change the style of? Pardon me? The error span? What else could we change the style of? Could change the style of this. You know, really give them a warning. So let's look how we can do that. I'm going to give this label an ID. Call it label temp. I'm going to in my CSS, which again Ultimately, this should be an external CSS file, but I, I'm just keeping it together just uh, for demonstration. I'm going give to a, give a class of error, 
and I will make the color red, background gray, and the font size ten percent bigger than normal. What I can do then is if there's a problem, I can say I can assign a class name of error to that span and also to the label. And that way we visually indicate that there's a problem with, with it uh, a couple different ways. All right? Of course, we'd have to change it back. Exactly. So, we would do something like this. Have a normal style, uh, class. Color black. Or actually, we won't even have to do that. We could just say size 1M, call this normal, and we could set the style of those two things to normal at the start. Now, one thing to notice here. I could have gone in individually I could have gone individually and set the background color you know and the text color and the font size I could have done that individually but I just put them all in a class and changed that why did I do that yes yes and yeah, if you have more than one thing on the form, you can give it that style. Also, what did you find in doing your uh, one lab, whichever lab that was? Um, the, the style changed in the background. Yeah. She had the issue of changing the tab color when the style changed. In other words, her two style sheets, the tabs, you know, she had way different colors on it. So if she changed the color, all right, then she changed style sheets, the tab color like really looked out of place, really clash with the rest of the page because that background color was based on the original style, not on the new style. Well, the solution to that was just to make a class in each of the two style sheets called selected tab. And then you can make it be whatever you want to in each tab. So this gives a lot of flexibility in, in doing that. So uh, again, this, this makes a lot of sense to do it that way. Uh, we should be back in business here. So let's go in and let's put in bogus. Let's put in, or let's put in a valid. Let's put in bogus. Let's put valid in again. And we're back in business. Now we could even do something like um, put an asterisk in front of the name simply by concatenating an asterisk at the beginning of it or whatever. But so there's a lot of things visually that we can do to that um, to indicate that there's an error message. Uh, if you're using color, again, it's good to use some other technique in case a person's colorblind. So that's why I made it color and a bigger font. Uh, you could use color in italics or, or any any combination of a couple different things. What about sound? What about a sound? Are there other questions? <laughs> Probably not a good idea. Yeah, they're annoying in a, in a web context like that for sounds to automatically play. Plus, for a sound to play, it would require downloading an audio file, and it's probably not worth the effort for that. So you couldn't use like the standard theme sound already 
Not that I'm aware of, no. No. The one thing you don't want to do, as I said, is pop up an alert box because, again, uh, those, those are annoying. I think it's much better to handle it this way. Um, you actually, uh, you know, some validations I've seen actually, you know, don't wait until you submit it. When you leave the form field, it shows you. And that, that's pretty cool, too. That might be something that we'll look on later on uh, in this for, for a larger form. But uh, that can be good. But again, all that really is is just calling a different event or having, a, having the, the validation called based on a different event on the on blur as opposed to a button click event. Questions about what we have here? All right, let's go and let's check to see if it's non-numeric. So we've checked to see if it is um, missing. Now let's validate to make sure that it is um, numeric. Yeah. Now, this syntax will be a little confusing because one of them where it kind of sounds like a double negative. There's a built-in function in JavaScript that evaluates and sees if a string is not a number. Yeah. Now that sounds odd. You, you might think that there'd be a function to check to see if it's numeric. Actually, the function's the opposite, to check to see if it's not numeric. And if it's not numeric, that's when we have a problem. And I'm going to do virtually the same thing except I'm going to change the wording of my error message. Instead of please enter temperature, I'm going to say, you know, please enter a numeric value. So I'm going to do the same thing as far as changing the class of that and changing the class of, of the label. I do think it's important to do that because I've seen Airmet, uh, um, form validation that just gives you a very vague sense that something's wrong. You know, <laughs> it's kind of like the, you know, it's kind of like you know nightmares that you might have where you're not really sure what's going on, but you feel a little queasy and you know something's wrong. Uh, okay, that's a really bad example, but you get the idea. The, the validations give you just sort of a vague sense that there's something wrong with the form, but not really tell, tells you what. Um, I had one in particular, a form in particular, that was causing me, me a problem. And the problem was is that it would not accept periods in the middle initial. All right? So Michael L. Zellers, it had to be Michael L. with no period Zellers. If I typed in Michael L. period Zellers, it gave me an error. But it didn't tell me that. It just was like a very vague, like, you know, middle initial incorrect, all right? Other cases I've seen is like where dashes are required or maybe dashes are not required, you know, in a credit card number. Do you put everything all, string it together or do you put the spaces in or does it matter how you do it? Will it figure it out? Whatever it is you're doing, make sure you tell the user that, you know. It's a good idea to give them a warning up front to say, hey, this is how I'm expecting you to enter a phone number in, but at the very least, if there's an error, be very uh, explicit about exactly what the error is as opposed to just saying, you know, eh, you know, invalid, whatever. All right, so let's make sure this works now. So now if I put nothing in, I get an error message. If I put garbage in, I get a different message. And if I put in a number, it still calculates. 
All right, so we're in business. Our last validation will be to check to see if the value is within our acceptable range, which is 0 to 100. And let's take a look at this. I'm going to type it in first and make sure it works. Then we will go back and talk about it. And you're absolutely right. Let's go pop these down here. Really? I'm thinking this code's right. Let's go and check it. Because I want to be able to put 32 in. I don't want to be able to put 31 in. I don't want to be able to put 31.9 in. I do want to be able to put 212 in. And I don't want to be able to put in 212.1. I am going to rephrase this error message. Please enter a number between All right. So now we have again, we've covered our range of validation for this. So if we put something in that is outside the range, we get an error. If we put nothing in, we get an error, a different error. If we put garbage in, we get still another error. Now, that's the basics of validation for a text box. All right? Trying to think what we want to talk about next time, because I don't think we have time to start anything new. But one thing I would want to talk about is um, validating other form controls. Because you can validate other form controls as well. For example, radio buttons. How do you know that one of the radio buttons has been selected? It's a different object, so you're likely not to use the exact same validation technique. It's a different object, has different properties, and so on. So it is quite likely that you won't have the same validation. All right. A drop-down. Actually, the validation for a drop-down will be pretty similar with just a little bit of a catch to it. All right, and we'll look at that. Now, the other thing that you can notice is we might actually have um, we might have a case of wanting to validate a bunch of things the same way. All right? And it would be to our advantage to write a function to do certain sorts of validation. So that may be another direction we'll take it in next time as we extend this. Um, 
trying to think of other things. I guess other things, you know, wh whatever we don't cover Wednesday, you know, we'll, come, we'll, we'll cover as we need it throughout the rest of the semester. But we'll, we'll play more with validation and doing a little more extensive validation and maybe writing, uh, you know, writing some functions that we can reuse to do some validation for us. We'll do that next time. All right. Questions? I will put this example up um, and we'll see you in lab all Wednesday.